our Christmas service. Thank you, Ian. Everything's okay. I was looking at that screen and it looked as if half my head was gone. So it looks as if I'm on the screen there. Thank you, Ian and Ewan. We're going to, again, we're going through the book of Revelation. And this morning I want to talk about silence is golden. And you're probably familiar with that song. But we're going to look at a passage in the Bible, in Revelation, where there is 30 minutes of silence. And so that's what I want to talk about. Silence is golden. We're looking at Revelation chapter 8. So let me read these verses. Revelation chapter 8 verses 1 to 5. Let me read them for you. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Here we are, we're still in the book of Revelation. Just to remind you of the story, we've got the only disciple left. He's been banished to the island of Patmos. His name is John, the beloved disciple, and he's well on in years. Very old, especially for that day, to be living to 96. He's... He's seen a vision of the resurrected Christ in all his glory in heaven. And then he tells us about these seven churches. The church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamon and Thyatira and Sardis. And of course Philadelphia and the church at Laodicea. He gives us this information. And so then he takes us into the throne room of God. Because after chapter 3 you no longer hear about the church on earth. The church is in heaven. And what we see is the throne room of God is an awesome scene. There is worship. There are 24 elders. There are four living creatures. There's a sea of glass and they are worshipping God. We get a glimpse into heaven. And then Jesus comes forth. There had been searching for someone to open the seven seals. No one was worthy to open them except for Jesus. And then we hear the songs of redemption, scenes of worship. And then as we get into chapter 6, the seven seals are about to be opened. And what we see come forth are four apocalyptic horses. A white horse speaking of deception. A red horse speaking of war and bloodshed. A black horse speaking of famine. And a pale horse, this composition of all things. The fifth seal is open and we see martyred souls in heaven under the altar. And then the sixth seal is opened and then we have this cosmic disturbance going on here on earth. And then we hear about four angels holding back judgment until 144 Jewish men who will become evangelists are sealed. And we continue to watch as these events in the book of Revelation unfold. Um, What we see is the lamb who takes the scroll. And what we see is these 144,000 Jewish evangelists saved, sealed and sent out to the nations. They preach and then a vast multitude come into the kingdom of God because of the great tribulation. Of course, we continue to move through the book of Revelation. Chapter 7 is this parenthetical chapter, if you want. 
This chapter is inserted to allow us to have a glimpse of God's grace. But it's now what is going to happen. We've been waiting for the seventh seal to open. I know we have our little event calendars and that. Even our Yvonne bought me one and you peel it back the different numbers. But here we're waiting for the number seven to open. What is going to be in there? And this, what is going to be in there? What we will start to discover, we will see things go from bad to worse. We're living at a time where things are going from bad to worse. We're living on this earth. And Jesus says, he talks about this tribulation period. If those days had not been shortened, no human being would be saved. That's what Matthew 24, verses 21 to 22 say. It says this, for there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Jesus' own words. When he's telling us about the future, we don't need to be ignorant of what is going on. Jesus tells us. And if you think things are horrible now, things are going to get a lot worse. Yet while... Delivered from the spiritual power of Satan, the believer is not spared from what he throws against us, the trials, the tribulations, the persecution. But now the seventh seal is going to be open. And when it is open, we will then we'll follow seven trumpet judgments. They will be sounded. So let's look at three powerful insights about silence is golden. I thought of just getting up and being silent for 30 minutes. How would we feel? (laughs) But we want to look at the first insight, which is the pause. There's the preparation and there's the prayer. So let me look at chapter 8. Let me read verses 1 for you. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Silence for half an hour. I've heard some preacher saying, saying the reason for that is there's no woman in heaven. <laughs> what a cheek. <laughs> what a cheek they have. But let's look at this first insight is the pause. We have the, the seventh seal. Let me read verse 1 for you as we've just read. We've read it. Let me read it again. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Think about that. It's open. Why this great pause? There's been worship. There's been praise. And sometimes we need to to go silent and let God speak to us. And that's something we need to learn. Sometimes when we're talking to people, we like to talk, talk, talk. But sometimes we need to be quiet and just listen. And John is describing this scene in heaven. It's an unusual one because you think of chapters 4 and 5. At the end of chapter 7, we've got this worship going on. But sometimes worship can be silent. And it's dramatic. We, we talk about the Quakers and they have services where the Spirit of God would move and they would just go quiet. I know they've deviated from some of the things of, of the, script, the teaching of Scripture. They'd be more in favour of universalism and all kinds of things now. But in their beginning, they would go silent and allow the Spirit of God to move. So it's... This dramatic pause makes it very impressive. And it's telling us something's going to happen. Therefore, there are a number of possible ways to interpret the the silence. It could be part of the worship. But what we notice is it's a short period. The silence is powerful. When you have a wedding, I conducted a wedding at the end of September. And there was a silence. And the silence was there to let you know that the bride was going to come. And silence can be nerve-wracking, especially when everyone looks at you. You Everyone goes silent and they look at you. After all, you can imagine asking, can you imagine asking someone to marry you and they go silent for 30 minutes? It'd be quite a scary experience. You wouldn't want that to happen. Yet, what we are seeing in this verse is the calm before the storm. 30 minutes, yes, it's relatively short. But it can be impressive. Um, Habakkuk says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth keep silent before him. Let the earth keep silent before him. 
Silence, as we said, can be a form of worship. Perhaps it shows holy reverence. That we've got nothing to say before a holy and an awesome God. In fact, it was also a state of court. When you would go into court in those days, there was a silence before the accuser would begin to speak. Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. That's what, that's what the psalmist says in Psalm 53. Um, Zechariah 2.13 says, Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is aroused from his holy habitation. And silence is good. Incidentally, on earth we often see people calling for a moment of silence when there's a tragic event. In England, um, we heard the horrific story of these parents that neglected their child and he died at the age of six, I believe. And the football club, I think, I believe it was Birmingham City uh, and Millwall were playing yesterday and they had a moment of silence to remember the little boy. And of course we do it for the, for the war and Remembrance Day. But here in heaven, it calls silence before the judgments fall. It's a strange that inhabitants of heaven understand what God is about to do. And it's interesting, when we look at the book of Revelation and the book of Joshua, there's some, you see certain things that are very similar. There is a pattern similar in Joshua that we cannot ignore. They go back to, they're taking control of the land. God's enemies are there. And if you look at the enemies of God, you've got, you've got, a seven year period where Joshua is engaged in this battle, the tribulation will be for seven years. And yet there is also an antichrist type of figure. There's a king called Adonai, Adonai Zekek, I believe his name is, the Lord of Justice, a bit of an antichrist type of figure. Two spies are sent out for the purpose of bringing Rahab to salvation. Rahab was very important because Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And it's the salvation that Jesus brings that we're here today. And they marched around Jericho. They had to keep silent. When you read Joshua 6.10, it says, Joshua commanded the people, say, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. Very similar. Don't forget these kings hide in a cave. And, we'll see, and we've seen that in the book of Revelation, where they're hiding in caves, wanting to die. But then we move on. That's the pause. But the second insight is about the preparation. I'm going to look at verses 2. So the second insight, let me read verse 2 for you. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Seven angels are pictured standing before God. They're ready, ready to do what God says. We need to be prepared to do what God says. We can't be caught out. We need to be ready. And Fiona was praying um, uh, that we don't know about dying. We can die tomorrow. I went to a funeral uh, on Tuesday. A, a pastor um, in Riverside Church in Bucky. His assistant pastor died the week before and, he, and I was attending his funeral on Tuesday. Do you know what his last words were to the church? He said that when he was young, he feared death. But his very last words to the church were, I'm not afraid to die. And we shouldn't be afraid to die because we know if we love Jesus, where we're going. That was his very last words. One of Gabby's friends passed away yesterday, the same age as her. So we need to be prepared at all times to be ready to meet our maker. And so here we have this. We need to be ready, standing before God um, in readiness, ready for service at any moment. But this is the first mention of the seven angels. We get more details, we'll get more insight as we read on. It is possible that they are the same seven angels that will pull up, pour out the seven bowls. See, you've got the seven seals, you've got the seven trumpets, but then come the seven bowl seals. And you read about these seven angels in chapter 15, verse 7. But what they're doing is there's, there's announcement being made. Um, 
whatever the connection may be, the seven trumpet angels announce a series of judgments that are to come. In the Old Testament, trumpets were used extensively for a variety of purposes. If a king was to be crowned, the trumpets were blown. You read of that in 1 Kings 1. Um, you, in the Old Testament, trumpets were used. Trumpets were used for celebrations. Trumpets were used for sacred um, gatherings or, or for a general assembly. You name it, trumpets were used for military gatherings to warn people. And although John undoubtedly would have known that the number seven was key, what happens in the book of Joshua? You read Joshua chapter six, verse six. What happens is seven priests were put in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, they're marching around the city of Jericho. Seven priests hold what? Seven trumpets. It's interesting when you see the, the parallels going on. And so in Numbers 10, you read of two silver trumpets. They were used to notify the people. A certain sound would be used to tell the people when to break camp and when to march. But think of Joshua on the seventh day after the seventh lamp, lap, they were to blow the trumpet and the walls of Jericho would come down. Therefore, the walls of rebellion that have been put up against God, they're going to come down. There's too much rebellion in our society. And when God sounds those trumpets, these walls of rebellion will be destroyed. And that's what happened in Jericho. After all, these trumpets were war trumpets. And they were used to sound the attack. So you see the preparation. God is preparing something. People are, are panicking. But we shouldn't be. Why should we panic? Our Gabby was saying to me, that in, she read this article about Sweden. They're implanting people with a microchip. And it's acting like they're, it can open cars, it can open computers, it can open doors. And they're trying to integrate it with a COVID passport. But that's not the mark of the beast. I'll tell you why it's not the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast will have to be on the right hand and the forehead. They're doing it on the left hand. But things, the world is preparing for a one world government. It's preparing for a one world religious system. And it, it is, it's preparing for these things, a one world economic system. So we need to be prepared and look at what the signs of the times are and match it up with scripture. But so we got the pause, we got the preparation. There's a third insight and that is the prayer. The third insight is the prayer. Let me read verses 3 for you here this morning. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. The angel who performs, a single angel who performs this priestly function is identified as another angel. After all, he has called another angel to distinguish him from the, the seven angels. Um, the word another means a different kind. And it almost looks like what the priest in the temple did in their ceremonies. But it is somewhat similar to the early vision of the 24 elders and the golden bowls of incense. And we read about the saint's prayer. The angel comes, stands at an altar, who's pictured offering the prayers of, of the saints. And I'm not talking about Roman Catholic prayers of saints or anything like that. Um, the smells and the bells and all that. But something's going on in heaven. Priests in the Old Testament would daily take a hot coal from the altar of sacrifice and carry it to the altar of incense. What you see... When you enter the tabernacle, there was there in the court, there was a, a big laver full of water where the priests would wash it. There was another altar where burnt sacrifices were put upon. And inside you would go into the holy place. And right before the Holy of Holies was, was an altar with smoke and incense would come up. And that represents the prayers of the saints. Um, remember Revelation 5, 8, when it talks about, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of saints. 
And saint, a saint is someone that's called out, a holy person. So there are two altars. The holy place is where the golden altar was, and it had to be attended three times a day. And sometimes we pray, and we pray, and we pray. We want something to happen, and it seems like that nothing seems to be happening. But when you look into heaven, you see that prayer comes before God. So don't be discouraged when sometimes things don't happen when you pray. Because prayer does come before the throne of God. And again we read in verse 4. And verse 4 tells us. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. Ascend before God from the angel's hand. Incense is added to the hot coals. A cloud of fragrant smoke rises from the altar. After all, this is a symbol of divine acceptance, a fragrant offering, a fragrant sacrifice. And when we pray in Jesus' name, our prayers are mingled with his finished work. It is a sweet smell. Ephesians 5, 2 tells us, it tells us, Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice to God. The scene in heaven suggests there's something sacrificial about genuine prayer. Genuine prayer where we were able to weep. Genuine prayer where we're able to cry before God. When you look at the prayer of Hannah, Samuel's mother, she has been tormented, this woman. Her husband has got another wife and she's been tormented. She's not able to have a child. And she comes to the place of worship. She comes to the house of God and she cries. And there are tears. The priest even thought she was drunk. But she's crying out to God. And God hears her prayer and he gives her a child. He's called Samuel, that great prophet. God hears genuine prayer. And yet these are mystery verses. But they do have a couple of lessons to teach us eh, when we think about it. They, when we read verses 5, the last verse here, let me read it for you. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings and an earthquake. This angel takes a censer filled with fire from the altar, throws it to the earth. In fact, the scene of intercession now becomes one of judgment. A bit like Ezekiel's vision. I mean, Ezekiel, Ezekiel talks about the fire from between the, the wheels. You read that in Ezekiel 10. The cloud filling the inner court, speaking of God's presence. Therefore, the same fire that causes the incense and prayer rises up to cause judgment. The prayer of the saints plays an essential part in bringing the judgment of God upon the earth. And maybe you're looking at things today where we're seeing all kinds of things that go against the teaching of Scripture and you think, why are the politicians allowing this? Why is this being allowed? Well, God's got a plan for the end time. And maybe you're crying out to God. Maybe you just want things to be the way that, this, the way that God would want them to be. But God's hearing your prayer this morning. When people reject God's love, His grace, and His Son... There is nothing le left but wrath and judgment. And of course, there's this thunder and lightning. It's repeated four times in the book of Revelation. And, when, and God is about to answer the prayers of the saints that is indicated by these noises. Sometimes when, when we pray, things might not happen right away. I, I remember in, years ago we were in a in Inverness in the church and we had so many friends that would die from drinking the bars were open all hours that um, husbands would spend their money they would, because you used to get paid weekly and the wife would get very little um, in those days and I remember us coming around and praying that God would shut down um, half the pubs and I believe that prayer got answered because many pubs have closed down. But the world just moves on and it invents itself and it continues to do the same old wicked things. But God does hear prayer. And whatever you're praying, pray it according to God's will. And we hear the sounds, earth and thunder and lightnings and, earth and an earthquake. Yet this is preparing for the...
devastating plagues. The plagues are the answers to the prayers of those people, those saints of God. Use the upper mic. It's gone off. Sorry, we're having issues with our technology today. So let's conclude this morning. Three powerful insights that we've looked, into, we've looked at. There's the pause. There's the seventh seal. There's a short period. There's the silence. There's the similarities between the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation. We've seen the preparation. The seven angels that are about to announce something. There's going to be an assault. And that's going to come from the seven trumpets that are going to be blown. We see the prayer. There's a single angel being used. There's the there's saints' prayers. There's the smoke, the scenes, and the sounds. All preparing us for the seven trumpets that are going to come. And each trumpet represents a judgment. So let's conclude this morning um, with these thoughts. Silence is golden was the title. Uh, thank you for bearing with us with all these technical issues we've had.